But a movie like this, first of all, it's one of my most watched movies of all time. And this is in my favorite top 25, top 30 films of all time. John dies at the end when I watched that, and I was saying with, in that video too. I'm not a sci-fi guy usually. I love Alien. It's a classic. It's still not a movie I throw on often. And it still it's, doesn't make my top 20 probably horror. And I think it didn't make my top 20 of the 70s. Yeah, but it wouldn't make my top 20 horror films. It wouldn't. Or films in general. Just Alien. It's a classic. It's a masterpiece of a film. But I'm, I'm good. Like, I'll watch it once in a blue moon. That's how I am with sci-fi. I'm very iffy. Like, it has to either work for me or not. And I came to the conclusion recently that I think just because of how, <laughs> the way I think in my, my, my mind, that the more out there the sci-fi is, the story is, everything in the movie or TV series or whatever is, the better. Like, Star Wars... I grew up with Star Wars. Like, Star Wars was a huge impact on me getting into film. After I saw Halloween Friday and was already into horror movies and stuff, but a few years after, seven, eight years old, nine years old at the most, is when I saw A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. And just blew me away and collected a whole bunch of friggin' Star Wars stuff too. <laughs> so just collecting always. I should be uh, the, the new collector if they make a new movie. If they're supposed to. Never did. Whatever. But this is a movie that, just like John Dies at the end, is just so out there. But this movie has honestly things in it that I've never seen in another film before. Before or since this came out, like I remember seeing this in theaters in 97. I was nine years old. I saw it with my dad. And I was blown away just by that. I mean, of course, I mean, it was 97. CGI was just getting huge. Jurassic Park was what, 93? When we really saw, okay, this is what CGI, this is what computers can do like mixed with practical effects and stuff and robotics and everything. And that blew everyone away. So this is only four years afterwards. Does it hold up to, to today? For me? Yeah. The CGI, for the most part, still looks excellent in this movie for me. And even if it doesn't look like completely like realistic if it looks like glaringly cgi it fits with the tone and the mood of the film for me it's just it looks weird because it's cgi but everything is weird in this movie so it just works there are some scenes in this movie that are just absolutely bonkers that are just things i like i said i've never seen in a film before or since this film came out there's one scene in particular. A few of you already know what it is because I did a short video of what makes this scene perfect on it. We'll get into it, but let's talk The Fifth Element from 1997. Just the cast, man. We got Bruce Willis. Who doesn't love Bruce Willis? And it's so sad and heart-wrenching, man, to hear what he's going through. The dementia or something like that, he's not doing well. And it, it, it's really, really unfortunate, man, that hopefully we don't lose him too soon. We have Chris Tucker, which I know, trust me, I am fully aware how annoying Chris Tucker is in this movie. And all the time. And when have you ever seen Chris Tucker play a role that's not Chris Tucker? He's always Chris Tucker. So, I mean, what else do you expect from him? I mean, yeah, this role is, like, really over the top. With him screaming and shit. But to me, it's hilarious. <laughs> it's just absolute insanity. And just seeing Chris Rock, like this... Uh, Chris Rock. Yeah, and that's going to happen, too. Because I always switch them up. Chris Tucker... Just skinny black dude, just screaming like a high-pitched, like, female scream. Like, 
<laughs> Dude, it's hilarious to me. But I fully understand how people don't like his character of Ruby Rod in this movie. Gary Oldman is a fucking legend in everything. <laughs> like, everything. There's not a thing Oldman has done that I don't love his performance in. He's just an absolute legendary actor. He can't stand this movie. <laughs> I read that he just said, no, I can't bear it. Like, I think he just needed, like, money at the time. He needed a car. and he, Who knows? Something like that. But he, he can't, he doesn't, he can't bear this movie. I don't know why. I love his, so his whole character, Zorg. The whole outfit, the colorful, like, weird, trippy, tie-dye-ish outfit that he wears weird plastic cover on the side of his head that's what i mean like there's just so many ideas in this movie that i've never seen ever again and it's it's just it stands the test of time for me and the cgi still looks great for the most part and just it's a great story like it really is like just taking the four elements that we know very well and are essential to our survival as the human race water <laughs> we need Wind, you know, oxygen, air, fire, and earth to grow food, you know, and just having a fifth one. And of course, I mean, by the end, we know the fifth element's love. It's a great fucking story, man. Luke Besson just did a phenomenal job writing this, an excellent job bringing this vision to screen. And just everyone was cast perfectly. There's some absolutely phenomenal scenes in here now if i recall correctly this was the first movie i think i remember seeing mila jovovich in every time i see her ever since all i picture her is this lilu in this i just picture her with the with the white band around her tits and around her body and and the just just an iconic look too and the orange hair on her and just everything is just strange and out there and weird and just so creative and imaginative in this movie like it's really unreal that a movie like this got made we have ian home in here from fucking alien there's such a great cast in this movie oh i get giddy watching this and like i said this is a film i can watch whenever the opening here we're in egypt and makes complete sense if there was something like this, like aliens that brought down, had a fifth element, a weapon like this to defeat evil stored on planet Earth, it would be in a pyramid in Egypt. Like, that's 100% where it would be. You ever watch Ancient Aliens? It's like pyramid is, is in every single episode for like 10 years now. It would be in a pyramid. That's exactly where that fifth element would be. And I forget the actor's name. I love the old priest here at the beginning. The guy with the long beard. And then the, when the ship comes down. And then just the way the aliens look. Like they're not your typical looking aliens or anything. And they don't look like little greys. They don't look like anything else that I've ever seen. Like they're just like big donut shaped things. Like brass looking like robots almost with like weird shaped faces awesome look to them and just the whole mood of this intro just being in egypt it looks really it looks really good like all the hieroglyphics and stuff on the the temple and stuff like this and the pyramid all over the wall everything looks great uh, then he gets uh, stuck in the room after they go in. They have the key that comes out of the alien's uh, finger. And they open the door and they end up taking the case, which looks awesome. Like it's like a sarcophagus almost, like casket, and they're carrying it out. And that's the fifth element in there. That's Lilu. And they're taking it, saying it's no longer safe on Earth. And then they're going to take it, and they ask, and they say, like, without the weapon, like, we're power, we're defenseless against evil. And the alien says, in 300 years, when evil returns, so, so will we. And the spaceship looks sick. <laughs> like, it looks good, man. Like, it doesn't look bad at all, the CGI spaceship. It, and it's an original-looking spaceship. Like, everything that's in this film... 
is just creative and original to the extreme. To as I, I will be saying this a lot, but like to the point of like I said, things that I've never seen since or before or ever, and I don't think we ever will again. And then I love the line that uh, then Ian Holmes' character uses a little bit later in reference to this opening scene when the priest is telling the alien who's stuck in the uh, tomb and the doors are closing and he's telling him, come on, you can still make it. There's still time. And he says, time doesn't matter. Only life matters. Great. Like, I love that line and I love when Ian Holmes uses it uh, later on in the film. The cinematography is fucking gorgeous in this film the, the whole movie the cinematography is absolutely stunning to me and i wonder so does like every one of those aliens have a key that comes out of their finger or is it just this lead guy because it's a lot of trust just to leave that key to one being and <laughs> like what could happen especially too when like when the spaceship's taking off after the, the one alien gets trapped inside and leaves his finger gets stuck and to the, the priest is able to take the key and he says i'll pass on the message to the next priest and stuff it's my destiny what if he forgets what if he becomes a drunk and he dies in a ditch and he's never able to get it the information of somebody. What if down the line, the 300 years and stuff, there's now one person who said, I'm not fucking believing in this and telling somebody. I mean, it's so far-fetched that over 300 years, every priest passed this down to the next one and that they still have a key or any of that. I mean, I, I gotta do this. I mean, even for films I love, I gotta. It's, it's, it's ridiculous, but Oh, I love it. And then when they walk into the room before it gets sealed shut, just the, like I said, the whole casket sarcophagus thing of the fifth element, the way that it's standing there with the mouth facing the sky, just like Lilu does at the end of the film, and how it floats out of the room. Like, they're not carrying it, it doesn't look like. It, it's just floating off the ground, and they're on the sides of it. That looks awesome. <laughs> like, everything about this beginning of this movie is fantastic. The president in this movie, the black guy with the eye that's bigger on one side than the other, he's great. I've seen so many things. I feel like he's the only thing, only person miscast in this movie as the president. I don't know. I just never thought that he was cast well here. J just a personal opinion. Never, never cared for him. But they're on the spaceship, and then they see the, this just giant mass of energy. And... Uh, Vito Cornelius is, is trying to tell them that like this is evil and like time is not important only life is important he uses those same lines and says that the, you can fire like every weapon you got at this thing and it's just going to make it stronger and it does and they start shooting at it and then people get blown the hell up it all looks great none of the CGI that I can recall <laughs> looks bad in this movie and Maybe it's me. Maybe there's people that look at it like it's ridiculous and it looks so dated. But for the feel of the film and the type of movie it is and just the, the whole atmosphere that he went for with this, it all fits perfectly. It's like, and it's a weird reoccurring theme this last week or two, man, with all the weird movies I've been picking. Santa, Santa Sangre is its own stylistic crazy weirdness too and uh, john dies at the end and a few others that i've been uh, dead alive like those a lot of examples right there of movies that just are so out there and just threw everything at the wall and it all completely sticks for me and this is just another one of them this colonel you know uh the, is um bruce willis's ex-boss i forget his name the actor but I when I first saw this, and for many times afterwards, and still to this day, I forget sometimes. I feel like that guy dies like three times in this movie. <laughs> like at three different points of this movie, it seems like he's killed, but yet he's just back again. Like another scene or two after that, it's so funny, and I love the scene like when the the big ball is like getting a lot closer and closer to this ship that's right there, and they're just so hypnotized by it that all they can do is just stare. The skull flame comes out and blows them up, and then we get Corbin Dallas. I am Corbin Dallas. Impossible. I am the real Corbin Dallas. 300 years into the future, Brooklyn is still a fucking piece of shit. This whole apartment is fantastic. 
just with the bed that closes back in and it rewraps itself and stuff with um plastic the the shower with the auto wash auto wash the the fish tank the the fridge that that folds in and, and goes down like what a cool friggin' apartment. What a cool design. This is a, a, a first example of something I've never seen in another movie. Just an apartment like this. And what could you say about Bruce Willis? I mean, it's Bruce Willis. He play, We all know he plays Bruce Willis in every movie that Bruce Willis is in. <laughs> but he's just, just such a badass, man. It's Bruce Willis. Who doesn't love Bruce Willis? And just, he was a natural, man. Ever since Moonlighting, the show back in the early 80s, mid-80s, he never went to school and no training, nothing for acting. He, he was just an absolute natural. And he just has so much charisma and just such a personality that everybody adores him. And he's, he's up there. He's in my definite 20 actors of all time. And... Oh, I hate thinking about it, man. It sucks. He's sick. Give me the key. This friggin' burglar comes up. He's got the big-ass spiky weapon with the weird target. And he's got, like, this big metal plate on his head. Even that's just weird. <laughs> but it looks cool. And he's, like, telling him, like, you don't, you know, it's not loaded. You gotta push that button there. And he's, this guy's nervous. He's shaking it. And he's, like, ha <laughs> he's laughing nervously. And he goes and he pushes the button. And it, like, disarms it or some shit. And he just ends up taking the gun. Let me... I think I'd better hold down to that. Puts into a bin with, like, a whole bunch of other guns. So it's like this happens on, like, a pretty regular basis that he's getting robbed here. And he takes all their weapons. I love about this whole story, too. Like, just as the screenplay, just as the story itself, is just a perfect example of showing just, like, just like Lilu says in the end. What's the point of saving life if all you build is you use to destroy and how true is that? It's even more so today than in, in the late 90s. Everything we, <laughs> as a human race, make and build, we use to destroy and wreck <laughs> and sever and just everything. And you feel for her in that moment at the end. Like, you really feel for her. You fucking believe her. Like, you agree. Like, yeah, she, girl's kind of right. Like... <laughs> What's the point of all this? If this is all, all that happens is just evil that just prevails all the time and destruction. Like I just all that whole theme throughout this whole movie. Just I love that. Now the alien race, the aliens with the rubber heads, awesome. Like I know how hokey it looks. I know how stupid it looks. It's so obviously a rubber mask. I mean, come on, we know. But it just, again, it works for me. Just everything, and I love when they're shooting down the uh, alien ship. And later on in my favorite scene in the movie, when you see Lilu like, seeing them, and then she remembers and she sees the flashback of the spaceship crashing into the planet, and that she was on it, like, that's that the same aliens from the beginning that were coming back. And they had the fifth element on it. And that's what ends up them getting that one fragment of the sarcophagus or whatever that she's in. Or that's what she's made of. I don't know if her body's inside that. Or if it's just her essence or whatever is in the statue. I'll say this about Cornelius' nephew. <laughs> yeah, I know he's for comic relief and stuff. But thank God the evil returned here when Cornelius had his mission. And... Not after he died, and it was his nephew's turn, because this world would be done if the nephew had to do this whole mission. Are you serious? The guy's a, a, just a nervous wreck. They get that one piece of the fifth element, and they put it in the little chamber that rebuilds from the DNA. And I love how, it how the guy says that it has the same DNA as us just so much more advanced that it seems like it was engineered, that it has just infinite knowledge. Just all of that is just great. Like, this, I can't say enough about the script in this movie and the story. And then her getting put back together and stuff. And then we get her in the iconic, like I said, with the, the bandages around her, which looks so cool. The orange hair, excellent touch. <laughs> and her performance is phenomenal in this movie. Mila Jovovich absolutely destroys 
the role of Lilu in this movie. Like, just her speaking the, the ancient language and stuff when she's going like, how did I have the same one? How did little baba? And like, just the words she said, like, they're not words, but like what she's rambling on. And like, you could see Bruce Willis, like, after she falls into his cab and like, and he's trying to with the big bada boom. You could see him laughing or trying not to from looking at her doing the gibberish and stuff like that it's so great man she's such a great actress so this is the first time here that i think that colonel guy dies when he goes up and looks in the case that she's in she punches through it but i always thought that she he got his heart ripped out like that she like went through like jason and <laughs> pulled his heart out and i thought he was dead uh, then he shows up at corbin dallas's apartment later with the heavy woman with the princess leia hair and the other guy and i'm like wait didn't he just get murdered <laughs> so this is instance one of his death i mean you can easily see that she just pulls him in, into the thing but i don't know young me just for some reason thought she just like punched through him and killed him all right the first shot when Lilu gets on the ledge and the police are chasing her and she looks out and you see all the cars flying in the air from down up all over cars are going this way i've never seen something like this in another film and like i said i'm not huge sci-fi i've seen a, my fair share i'm just not a big fan like fan of sci-fi i'm sure it's been done but just the way it looks and the way it's done here i i don't know i don't think it's ever been done at least in a mainstream film like for sure and it looks fantastic like it still does from 97 to 2023 right now i think it looks fantastic all the cars driving around and then <laughs> later on when he has the chinese restaurant come up to his window <laughs> And he's eating there. You think he's like just chilling. And then he just takes off the Chinese restaurant. Like as he's on a boat. And he's just like paddling through the air. You don't see this in any other movies, man. And you can see Bruce Willis just trying not to laugh, man. He's holding it in. <laughs> And when she smacks the uh, divider between the front and the back of the cab, <laughs> and he goes, he moves back. That's that's so funny. They must have had so much fun making this film, man. And Bruce Willis has. I, I'm pretty sure I read a quote from him saying that it was a very fun film for him to make. Bada boom. <laughs> that's so funny man the, so he decides i mean who's not gonna try to save this girl who just fell into your freaking cab this gorgeous woman who's half naked of course you're gonna try to save her so he he's being pursued by cops and stuff and the futuristic mcdonald's i would love to know how much they paid for the product placement i gotta find that out I'll probably edit that in here. It sounds so weird using that word. Edit. The girls with the red hair, with the, the arch hat, and the cops sitting there eating the McDonald's. And I love the, the score and soundtrack throughout all this movie. Just, it's all fantastic. Just uh, this whole chase and stuff. And then again, they, they crash, the cops crash into a whole truck of, of, um, uh, mcdonald's but like this arabic or whatever type music <laughs> like going on during the chase excellent and then there's another scene later on with some great music the shots of uh corbin driving the taxi down and going through all the lanes of traffic and stuff that looks fantastic too like i don't know man if anyone says to me that they don't think that at least it still holds up today i don't know i'd have an argument there I'd, ha I'd i'd have to debate that like the cgi looks still pretty goddamn fantastic to this day decades later corbin comes with lilu and she's unconscious in his arms he knocks on the door because she says his name vito cornelius right before she goes unconscious he knocks on the door 
Cornelius opens, and he says, I'm looking for a priest. Weddings are one floor down, my son. Congratulations. And he goes to shut the door. His delivery is fantastic in this movie. I love when they're trying to talk to each other. Like, after he kisses her to wake her up, and she pulls the gun out. Ectogama! We're like, he asks later, what does that mean to the priest? He's like, never without my permission. That's hysterical. But when he's trying to say, like, what's your name? Like, I'm... Corbin Dallas and like and she spouts off that long ass goddamn name <laughs> and he's like oh that whole thing's your name he's like, All right, like can you sh- sh-? like you know, Corbin Dallas you me Cor-. and she goes Lilu what a great name for her too and then I love Ian Holm his his outfit with the four element designs and even those designs too on the stones look fantastic oh, I love this movie <laughs> the fuck out of here when she goes. <laughs> She goes into the microwave with, like, she she just drops something in, like, a big-ass thing, puts it in the microwave, she goes, chicken, good, and then, like, just cooks it for, like, two seconds, pulls it out, and it's just a whole big meal, chicken and, like, salad, it's, oh, man, what a future. And again, Gary Oldman as Zorg is just fantastic here. His whole suit, the plastic thing, his hair to the other side, his accent, the way that he talks, his little personality, like... Like, he takes joy in all of this. What a fantastic character. It's such a shame Oldman doesn't like this movie. But when he's showing the gun, that... And this is a funny thing throughout this whole thing. Several times, people get the box with the stones in it and don't check shit. (laughs) They don't look in the chest. They just say, we got it. And then they leave... Uh, then they get back here, and then they open it, and there's no stones there. It happens, like, at least twice, if not three times in this movie. No one checks before they leave. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. But the scene here with the gun, that's another thing. Never seen in another movie before. He starts shooting it. He goes, he shoots one shot at a dummy. So it's like a looks like a cop and he says once you shoot the one shot every successive shot goes to the same location and he starts like going and fucking drilling down in their location but all the bullets are flying back to the dummy that he starts it has a flamethrower it has a fucking net it has a, a, a friggin frost machine that turns you to ice and a rocket launch <laughs> Dude, never have I seen a weapon like this in a movie before. Another thing in this movie is the editing. I love the editing in this movie, especially with certain cuts, like this one right here, when Zorg is looking into the case, and he says, this case is empty, and it cuts to Mila Jovovich laughing. (laughs) That is brilliantly done. This case is empty. (laughs) Love all of that. Like, they use that a few times in here. And that was a pretty 90s thing. And another thing that I'll mention a little later is another pretty 90s thing. But used to such great effect here. Like, I I love the editing. These stupid rubber-headed alien people. He leaves them one case at a goodwill. Even though they brought no stones because they're stupid and they didn't check the, the case before they got there to see if there were actually stones in it. They carried around an empty chest. Stupid aliens. Zorg leaves with his bodyguard and then they're just stupid and they're looking at the red button. They push the red button and it blows them up. But they're alive later. So, <laughs> I don't know. But they, they survived the explosion. I love this whole meeting between Cornelius and Zorg. And this whole little... Uh, monologue, mini monologue from uh from Gary Oldman here. Life, which you so lovely serve, comes from destruction, disorder, and chaos. Now take this empty glass. Here it is, peaceful, serene, boring. But if it is destroyed And then all the robots come out and they're oh, zipping man. around and they're cleaning up the mess. I love that. Like a bunch of Roombas. And then he chokes on the cherry. And he's hitting all these buttons. And all these things are flying out of his desk. And then he has this weird pet that just is so random. He has a pet that's like, it looks like a tiny, I don't even know, man. A picture with the, like the trunk. 
<laughs> he's trying to ask it for help, like, uh, he's choking on the cherry, and then for some reason, Cornelius saves his life. I mean, he's a father. We'll chop it up to that. Like, they've never done a bad thing, priest. Zorg spares his life. For now. Because he ended up patting him on the back and getting that cherry out. This movie, they knew the Heimlich maneuver. Kind of. He just kind of smacked his ass on the back. Again, I love th the Chinese guy who comes with the restaurant right to your window. And he's telling him that, like, you know, it doesn't rain every day and that good news is going to come and that he gets uh, mail. And he says, open it. I bet you lunch is good news. And then he opens it <laughs> and he reads it and it says, you are fired. That is so funny. And then he just says, well, at least I won lunch. You go philosophy. <laughs> I love that. What a great little side character. So now the Major, I thought his heart got ripped out. And his uh, Major Iceborg wife, that's going to accompany him. Which he wants nothing to do with. He's like, I am not going. Which is hilarious. And the, the other guy, the, the Colonel, whatever, he's just like, why not? Like, he's totally oblivious. So she takes uh, the name tag off the door, and then he says, he makes up this whole excuse that he's, it's his wife, but like, they didn't get married yet, he's going to marry her, but he hates the military and knows that it ruined his last, his last marriage, and he starts shoving these people into the fridge, and this is the second time that I think that this guy dies. A little bit later on, they open it, and he says, I'll, I'll take the mission, and he takes the, the paper out, and they're frozen to death. So he's dead, but he's back again later. So then rubberneck aliens, they're saying that they got to get to Floss in Paradise, and if Zorg really wants the stones, then he's going to have to negotiate. So everyone's trying to get on this ship to get to Floss in Paradise. The rubber aliens, the friggin' uh, police are trying to get Corbin Dallas away. The uh, Zorg is trying to get there. The priest is trying to get there. And then Corbin and Lilu are getting there. Like, everyone is on a race to get to Floss of Paradise. And then, just this amazing scene. Oh, I forgot about the auto wash. There's an auto wash in the shower. Oh, the auto wash. Auto wash. Yes, auto wash in the shower. The whole airport, like, saying, sorry about the mess. And there is just trash everywhere. In the back of this airport, or spaceport, whatever you want to call it. Just like a landfill in the background. You never see that. <laughs> the outfits that the stewardesses wear that for the plane, the spaceship, looks really cool too. And I love when like David goes <laughs> with Lilu and he's shaking like the coward that he is. And uh, then Bruce Willis shows up. <laughs> Corbin shows up. And he's like, oh, yeah, well, I just sent David here to, you know, I thought it was going to be late, but he's got to go now. Take care. <laughs> Man, I love Bruce Willis. Multipass. Multi Lila at Multipass. You know this Multipass. Lila Dallas, my wife. We're newlywed. Just met. You know how it is. Bump into each other. Sparks happen. Yeah, she knows it's a multi. Anyway, we're in love. And then the alien shows up who has the fake face on and stuff. And this guy looks like he's... <laughs> this guy looks so inhuman. It's unbelievable. <laughs> he's like, his face is morphing right in front of the stewardess. Like, they're like, yeah, we'll be right back. <laughs> And they leave. Like, this guy's freaking out. And then there's like a gunfight between them and everything. Like, cool, nice little shootout. There's a lot of racist shit in this movie, man. When you look at this, all the people, all the fans of Ruby Rod, he just made his appearance. There are all these little Asian girls. <laughs> and then there's other examples as we go on. But they're all little Asian girls. I love how he comes by with, he just dips the paintbrush and paint and walks past and just like slides paint on like all of their pictures at the same time. I love him. I just love Chris Tucker. And then they have sleep regulators, which is awesome, man. They basically just drug you and knock you out <laughs> for your entire flight. Perfect. That's pretty much what I do to myself for any plane ride. Not much of an advancement, but 
pretty good. You can take this whole space travel and just not, just like pretty much time travel there. Just pass out, wake up, you're there. I want one position, I want all positions. And then this is another thing I was saying with the racist shit. They, they have great music. They got the reggae music playing and they got all these Jamaicans underneath the plane and they were all spraying the bugs or like the creatures or whatever that like these critters that are like stuck in like the engine and stuff. Hilarious scene. They're all smoking weed. <laughs> They're all, they got a Jamaican hat with Jamaican dreadlocks. It's a lot of Jamaicans in movies I've been talking about lately. Awesome scene, though, but <laughs> it's so out there. And at the same time, we have Chris Tucker, Ruby Rod, eating out the stewardess. He's going down on her, and then he keeps coming up and talking, whispering in her ear, and she's like, oh, she's freaking out. She's fucking ready to come. Like, he keeps going down on her, and then, like, as the plane takes off, her legs are, like, this, and then they raise up. So who is Mr. Shadow? I were, I'm assuming that it's implied heavily that it's whatever that big mass of ball of energy is that's racing towards Earth near the end. It's just some manifestation of that energy. It's just a voice from that energy. I'm guessing, but why would it want the stones if he could just crash into the earth later? Like, I don't know what I don't know what the connection is between the big ball of energy and Mr. Shadow. Unless they're the same thing. But again, why he says money is no object. I don't know how a big ball of energy is gonna pay this guy. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to make sense. Like, that's what I'm saying when it comes to sci-fi for me. The more out there, the better. Because then there's no rules. It's like, it, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> like, you can make up whatever you want. And if it works for somebody, it's going to work. And it just, uh, oh, I love this. And then I love how the blood starts coming down, like, as he's talking to him on the phone, Mr. Shadow. That's cool. That used to actually creep me out as a kid when I first saw this. The blood coming down from the plastic and stuff like that, and he rubs it. That's cool. We've arrived at Flossin Paradise! And, again, they get here. Everyone's Hawaiian. Everyone's playing Hawaiian music and putting the flowers, the lays and stuff on people. There's a lot of that in here. And this film is just so fucking stylish, man. And the colors and just, I said, the cinematography. But, oh, we're coming up to my favorite scene here. And just one of the greatest scenes ever. The whole look of Plava Laguna with the veil on. And I forget who the actor is. The friggin' young guy who's, like, like freaking out trying to read the lines to her. And he's, like, starstruck. But the whole veil over her, she looks so mysterious. She looks so beautiful. She looks so alien. And then she has that telepathy thing with her bodyguard. And she knows that Lilu's around the corner. And she goes and says, that, like, the diva's glad you're here. Like, she'll give you what you came for after the show, after the performance. And then this ship is just taking off into space, flying around this beachy island, floss in paradise, and it, it, it's gorgeous, man. And just this whole ship looks amazing. Oh, man. And, and, and Chris Tucker's uh, his outfit, the black, whatever it is, it's not even like, it's like a way out there tuxedo thing with roses around him. Like, he's such a crazy character. Then there's the deaf guy when Chris Tucker's walking down and he's saying on the, his radio show, he's saying, this person's over here, and then this person, and he's like, we got the, this guy, he's deaf as a stump, but he has got all these Asian girls hanging out around him. <laughs> Dude, it's so weird. Like, the, the, the weird little cliques of cultures in this movie. So everyone makes their way into the theater, and the leader of the rubber-faced aliens, he's a waiter with the black face disguise. Not blackface, he's black. You know what I fucking mean. And he goes into the room with the rest of them and says, and this is just the best scene coming up. I don't care. I'm, I'm letting this entire scene play.
Commander, I have shipping trouble requesting permission to dock for repairs. Put him in the dock and garage and form security. Oh. Permission granted for one hour. More than I need. Yes! Champagne for the diva. I'll take it. That is just a top 20 scene in a movie for me. Absolutely flawless. There's not a thing I would change. It's absolutely perfect. It's so out there. It's so creative. It's so original. And like I said, never seen anything like it again. Fucking bravo, Luke Besson. So then they start a full out war, the rubber faced aliens, and they're shooting people left and right and they shoot they shoot poor Plava Laguna, man. And Bruce Willis has a moment with her and she starts saying, like, you know, he starts asking her where where are the stones? And she starts saying that gives a whole nice little speech that Lilu is more fragile than she seems and she needs your love and everything. Aw, come on, Lilu and Corbin Dallas and Bruce Willis, come on, how can you not love that pairing right here? Fantastic. And then he reaches inside her and pulls the stones out. And again, the designs of the stones are just fantastic in this. She needs your help. And your love. And then we just go into just full-on action mode, like typical Bruce Willis. Just gunfights, just so much fun. And then Chris Tucker again, man. <laughs> it's just hysterical to me in this. <laughs> Starts asking, Corbin, is that a mob? And they're racing under the cart they're getting shot at. And just he's screaming like a lunatic. <laughs> <laughs> I love when the rubber aliens got uh, Cornelius. And they say, uh, send in someone to negotiate. And then Bruce Willis just walks in. He shoots him right in the head. And he says, anybody else want to negotiate? Just such a, cla such a Bruce Willis line. <laughs> So there's the bomb that Zorg put on, and again, he grabs the case, he leaves, and he opens the fucking case, and there's, there's nothing in here, it's empty. You don't look in the, the friggin' chest. Come on, man, that's the, the stupidest stuff in this movie, but I still don't care. This is great line, like I said earlier, from Leo. <laughs> Destroy. 
And just another classic, just Bruce Willis line <laughs> when the president calls him. It says like when they're on their way to the temple with, with Lilu and the stones, and he says, "We have a problem." He says, "What's the problem?" <laughs> He says there's a ball of fire like 1,200 miles of diameter heading straight for Earth, and we don't know how to stop it. How long we got? About an hour and 57 minutes, so they'll call you back in two hours. <laughs> so Bruce Willis. And that's sad, man. When Lilu, look at you saying that she's only up to V on her learning screen, and then she gets to W for war and just sees just every terrible, depraved, deviant, evil shit us as a human race has ever done <laughs> in our entire existence, and no wonder she don't want to save us. Like, who, I don't blame her. Let the thing explode. And then, just the whole thing of them putting the stones together, like, on the pillars, and them figuring it out, saying match up the configurations and everything, and then saying to the priest, like, all right, done now... What happens? He's like, well, now we have to open them. And you know how to do that, right? Well, theoretically, no. And then they're trying to figure it out. And the the clumsy nephew is sitting there by the wind one. He's just like, we're never going to make it. And, just, and it opens it. And then they realize that you need each of the elements to be able to open up the stones. And then when Chris Tucker is at the fire one and he doesn't have matches... Oh, I die every time. Kobe? Kobe, my man? I have no fire. I have no matches. I see nothing matches. I have no matches. I have no matches. I, I, I stop smoking. If I knew, my father, you smoke. <laughs> and even the, just the, the stone, when they open up, the, the pillars of light that comes up for each element, that looks great, too. And then just they stand in the middle, and she says the whole thing again, like, why, why bother saving? And she says, you know, he says love is worth saving, and that he loves her. Oh, what a great love story, too, this is. And then, it's a, of course, it's the fireball's like three seconds from hitting Earth <laughs> before she finally fucking opens her mouth. And, oh, Guy's alive again, the colonel, who froze to death earlier. He's alive. And the beam that comes out of her mouth, like when all the, the uh, lasers of the colors, like, converge, and then it shoots up out of her mouth just like the statue from the very beginning, and it just freezes this... Mr. Shadow slash Fireball looks looks great. Like can't complain about any of the CGI upon now like it's almost over. Looks all great. Like nothing looks a bit dated to me in this. It it really does it. And then Corbin's mom, who's been calling a few times annoyingly throughout the whole movie. That's a little annoying. I don't I don't find Ruby Rod that annoying, but I find the mom calling <laughs> Calling Bruce Willis and nagging, I find her annoying. Yeah, I do though. Besides that, and then you just you just see them fucking in the uh, the little uh, tube that they're in, the little uh, container that they re that they rebuilt her in, and they're fucking and they're having a grand old time. And the president wanted to thank them, but they're too busy. What a fun movie, man! What an original movie! What a creative movie! Just hits every single beat for me. I get giddy every time I watch it, but I guess I will talk to you soon. Hope everyone's having a good morning, afternoon, and night. Take care.